Welcome to Your Best Bets. It's a Live Golf Monday here at Your Best Bet. We haven't gotten too much in depth about the uh, Live Golf Tour in, in a few weeks, but we got a lot to get to with that. We have a little city review as well, and uh, lots to talk about with the Memorial. Uh, one person that has not yet signed with Live Golf Tour, Johnny Strauser, is here. Johnny, welcome. Thank you. And yeah, I'm, I was mulling that offer and the, um, uh, the deal was, was I could not play in the little city, which, you know, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I did commit to on this show. So unfortunately that was a deal breaker, did not realize that was in the, in the contract there. So I had to turn down the, uh, the, the sum of money that they did offer me, but glad to be on the show. And, uh, I was glad to play in the tournament this last weekend. But, I mean, if you keep holding out, I mean, listen, there's some really obscure Asian players uh, on, on live, the Live Golf Tour. Chase Kepka. I mean, I, I would, I would favor you over him in a head, head match. So, hey, you, you never know. Maybe like a two million dollars signing bonus is right around the corner once you're once you're discovered by the tour. Um, so you alluded to it. Uh, we'll we'll do a, you know a quick discussion uh, review about the Little City Championship this week. Uh, this past weekend at, at, at McMillan Park, I think everything we 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 talked about last week in the preview uh, mostly came true from what it sounded like. I was not in the tournament. Um, I know Zach here last week; he had to withdraw. He had a back issue. Uh, also, while he's why he's not on the show tonight because sitting is is an issue. So get well, Zach. Um, but we we predicted somewhere around even par would probably win this tournament, and that that. Part mostly came true. Uh, one under wins it, where Ansberg wins his second straight win on the Fort Wayne Golf Association. Uh, you you finished, uh, I think, T seven. Uh, it sounds like you were really close and just couldn't couldn't eat, couldn't get any putts to drop. You know, good Tiger line. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I feel like, and that's what I I'm going to go with there. But yeah, it was. Uh, um, I think we say it every year that either both of us or one of us plays in the event that. You know, you just got to figure out how to get to about even par and you've got a good chance at, at winning. I know sometimes it's been a couple under, two, three under par. Um, I know Scott Perry's won it um, before at, you know, five or six under par. But, uh, um, you know, typically that golf course as, you know, you'd think it would be an easy golf course. It's 40, 4,600 yards or something like that, par 65. You know, you'd think that you could just get around there and shoot a, couple 55s or something ridiculous like that but you just you absolutely cannot do it there but we had great weather both days uh minimal wind which usually it ends up blowing and the wind is always kind of tough because the the, the routing of the the holes you don't get a lot of totally downwind totally into the wind i know i've talked about that with um you know with a lot of other courses we played you know like coyote does that as well um but um but yeah i mean the the golf course it was slightly different now that it's under new management. It used to be uh, managed and the tournament was, was run by Rick Hemsoth who had run it for years and years and years and always would put his little bit of flair and challenge into it, especially that second day where he'd stick tees back a little further. He would put pins almost off the green and he would create these great angles that you get um, going into the holes there. But uh um, it was a little bit more traditional this last time. Still, the course was was uh, um, just as tough. The one thing was very, very difficult about the golf course is, is the greens felt spongy when you walked on them. So it felt like you could make a footprint when you when you're walking on them. The grass was slow. So the greens putted very, very slowly, but you could not hold the greens and, and the greens generally square footage wise are going to be as big as you know, a small house, these greens are as big as a, as a bedroom. I mean, they're, they are so tiny and they're not overly sloped, but if you, if you had a, a middle pin and you played it to fly pin high, you know, so the same distance as the pin, the ball would almost automatically bounce over the green and you'd have a, a tough chip coming back. So you really had to, to understand that and, and play that accordingly. And there was a lot of holes that you really, it was tough to run it up on. Um, and then it seemed like the, we'd have some holes that played into the wind and you'd play that same type of thing where you'd, you'd land it short of the green or on the front edge and let it bound, bound up towards the pin. 
and, and the ball would spin. So it made it, the conditions made it tough. Um, it didn't make it unfair by any means. You just had to know how to play the golf course. And it's hard to hit shots, us amateur golfers. It's hard to hit those types of shots all day long where, you know, you'll think about British open, open championship golf. How you have to run the ball up a lot, um, lay it at 10, 15, 20, 30 yards short of the green and run up. You just, you had to kind of do that, but you, you had, you need a little bit of luck, um, my, my game personally, I, I hit it pretty well, really struggled with the putter. The slow greens really got me. Um, they rolled pretty true, but um, they, they were just hard to make putts for me. And if you, if you made putts um, like in a PGA tournament, you're generally going to contend. And that's, uh, that's what I saw a lot of, um, you know, over the weekend there. So I went out and I shot three over par the first day, which was a little bit higher than, than, than my goal. Um, and I came back the second day, I was actually six or two under par through, uh, through seven holes, had a decent chance on the eight for birdie, had a really good chance on nine to go to three under on the day. And that would have got me even for the tournament. I think I had five and a half, six feet, um, and a fairly easy putt, missed that putt and just could not make anything, uh, on the way in and up shooting even par, which was a pretty good score, but based when you start out two under par and a chance to go three under yeah. through nine, even par is, is just kind of the worst possible scenario is what you want. So, you know, it, it, it uh, um, I won the event before by, by shooting uh, one, two under par or something like that. You know, you could win it um, this year at one at one under, but you know, three over par, not too bad there, but considering the, the, the quirkiness and challenge of the golf course, but, you know, it was good, solid play by Rory. Uh, this is the second event that he's won. Um, a good friend of ours, Brady Wheeland, um, finished, was it third place? Yeah, uh, third place this week. I, I got to play with him the first day uh, with him and his brother, and he, he played really well for most around and, and uh, um, you know, had to play with, uh, with Rory that second day and played, played great. So there were some good scores out there, uh, both the first day and the second. Um, it's just, it's just so weird to me. And I know you've played that golf course. You grew up on that golf course. So you know that, you know, you're not going to go out there and shoot a 61 or 62 all day long, you know, something around par is generally a, a good score around there despite the length and, you know, I think that's just kind of, that's how that course goes every single year. Yeah. You mentioned the greens being slightly different than it's played in prior years. I mean, I, I, you, you get these uh, McMillan park stands that, I mean, for, you know, playing that event in the mid 2010s every year, or early 2010s, the greens really were great. I mean, they rolled as good as any in the city. You get these people, there's no greens better than McMillan park. And you'd be like, really? But then you play it, you're like, okay, these are, these are really good greens. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it had to be a bit of an adjustment for you guys this weekend playing them when you expect them to maybe, uh, you know, be a little faster. Um, yeah, they've, they've always rolled really true. So that had to be an adjustment. Um, you mentioned the winds, uh, you know, as far as not being tr too windy, you know, in the past, you mentioned playing crosswinds there. It is, it is kind of tough. You think of a hole like number two with a crosswind or, um, you know, five, six, and seven, six and seven are, are tough holes with, I mean, it's some really tight landing areas if in a crosswind. So it, it does sound funny when you talk about McMillan Park, par 65, really short course, but it, it is, and for whatever reason, it's just tough to score. Um, uh, you know, you, you have your opportunities, but um, you also have some chances where you can make some bogeys or, you know, double comes into play like a whole like 13 where, you know, that, that road really feels tight there on the left side. Um, but congrats to Rory back-to-back -back wins. Very impressive. Chris Schweitzer runner up, uh, you know, good on him. Uh, 18 hole leader. Um, I'm sure he's unhappy to get it, to, uh, you know, to not get it done, but uh, obviously a good showing. And we mentioned Brady, um, uh, you, you played with, uh, Kevin Spieth, not Jordan's dad, um, in, in round two, you said he made everything. He, uh, yeah, 62 on, on Sunday. That's super impressive. Uh, he finished T3 and then, uh, Justin Morgan also finished T3. So, um, sounds like it was a good event. Uh, next one will be, uh, this, this weekend at, at, at Chestnut Summit City Classic, um, Gosh, I, I think I talked about this on a prior podcast. Back in my high school days, Chestnut was the course around here, and I was so terrified of it. Um, 
I, I don't necessarily think it's that way now, but still a good course. Um, so I'm not, I don't think, I know you said you will not be playing in it. Um, I will be working this weekend. So yeah, I will not be playing in it, but yeah, you're right. You're right. Chestnut is, is get, you get a little claustrophobic when you play it. Oh my gosh. You got like, yeah. OB on, on the left, uh, you know, hazard on the right. It feels like every hole and it, uh, it, it can be mentally draining out there if you're not hitting well. Um, so see what happens this week at the summit city classic. Um, Johnny, the memorial, um, man, Billy Horschel has a way of just kind of just ruining some things in life. You know, um, it just, he just pops up and he just, he just takes away your joy. Uh, it, when you least expect it, um, uh, seventh PGA tour win this weekend. And it was never really in doubt after Saturday's round, I guess there was a moment or two of doubt on Sunday. Um, Aaron Wise played really good golf, and uh, he was he was kind of there on the back nine. It never really felt like it was in jeopardy uh, of Horschel losing this. Um, uh, so yeah, I as I alluded to last last week, I was going to be at the event. So I, I arrived Friday um, and, and left uh, you know Sunday. And uh, I I couldn't be more impressed. It was I didn't know what to expect, but it was it really exceeded my expectations as far as the event, the golf course. Um, the event really feels like a top-notch event. Obviously, I haven't been to a ton of them, but just the way the tournament is ran and the sort of the hospitality and all the facilities are just, it really does feel like a second to none type of course. And I think I texted you and Zach, I said, this place feels like Sycamore, but on steroids. Um, and I don't think TV does it justice as far as the, um, it's it's really hilly uh, in certain spots. I mean, nine. If you think about nine, it's it's a it's a approach shot that comes down the hill. But I mean, it is it is. There's a lot of undulation on that golf course. The, uh, number ten teeing off. It goes way up the hill. It's just stuff that you can't really see on TV. You really appreciate while you're there. Um, so yeah, I took my two boys, and um, you know, we 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 had a really good time. It, you know, it was a little rough for my eight year old at times. It was hot, a lot of walking. I guess I didn't anticipate and budget some of that. Um, but my my ten year old was totally gung ho. We, you know, he would line up in certain spots to get fist bumps from the guys. He got, you know, he got a fist bump from Jordan Spieth, Cam Young, Will Zalatoris, Victor Hovland. So, you know, he was he was really going for the elite players uh, as far as. Uh, you know, contact with them. We got Ricky Fowler's autograph. And I got to say, um, as much shit as Fowler gets for a lot of things, um, I have to say his, I mean, the throng of kids when he came out of, um, out of the scoring area Saturday, he played with Jordan Spieth. Um, there was so many kids there and he signed every single thing that was put in front of him. And it was, it was, I mean, he was there a good 15, 20 minutes and he had just shot 75. So he, he, he Obviously couldn't have been in a great mood, but credit to him, signed everything. Um, he signed uh, my kid's golf ball that he got from, uh, of course, Matt Kuchar's caddy uh, as, as Kuchar came off. So um, it, some sort Matt of, Kuchar. of course, yeah, Kuchar. Um, so my kid was pretty excited about that. But uh, yeah, we were waiting for guys like Spieth and Rory to sign, but they didn't come out. And uh, but yeah, we got guys like Keegan, uh, Cam Davis, um, you know, a lot of a lot of kind of your second tier guys. Joel Damon was great. Um, so really good experience. Um, yeah, I was I was imp I was really impressed with everything. I'm just disappointed Billy Horschel won. Yeah, I, I would agree there. And, you know, I've, uh, uh, I, I'm lucky. I grew up in the Flint, Michigan area. Um, and I was 15 minutes from where they had the old, uh, had the old Buick open. I can remember going to that event. Usually it was on Tuesdays or Wednesdays because the Flint junior golfers, um, if we brought in our, our bag tags, we had free admission. Um, but we would always go to one of the practice rounds. And as I got older, we'd get tickets to the, uh, to the actual tournament. And a lot of times we could end up getting free tickets. Um, but, uh, but I remember when I first was not able to get tickets, it was only $15 per ticket for a day mm -hmm. pass. And I get you anywhere, anywhere, but the clubhouse there. And I went every single year and I've gone to a couple other PGA tour events and they're, and they're great. They're just, they're just cool to go do. 
And if you don't have kids, they're fun to go to. If you have kids, I'm sure they're like, you like the experiences you got, you know, with them meeting the pros and everything. That's great there. So I encourage anybody, if you've got any opportunity to go, whether it's, a, you know, an event in Chicago or if it's Memorial um, or up to the Rocket Mortgage up in uh, the Detroit area. I mean, it's just, it's, it's good stuff. So, but with that being said, yeah, Billy, Billy Horschel. I mean, he's just, uh, he's just so, you know, he's just so unlikable. I mean, he's, he's, I don't, I think he's actually a great, great guy all, you know, for the, for the most part, you know, what it seems like, but he just, you know, he's, he, I don't think a lot of people love the guy, you know, he's just, he's that brash, yeah. somewhat arrogant, outspoken, you know, he just kind of comes off a little bit weird there and he doesn't have that incredible game. Like, uh, you know, like, you know, a Cam Young or a Dustin Johnson, or, you know, he just doesn't wow you with anything. So you're just like, yeah. okay, it's Billy Horschel. You know, that's, that's <laughs> fine. But I mean, he's won, you know, he's, he's won the FedEx cup. He's won uh, um, uh, the WGC match play. Um, you know, he, he always plays well in Florida, his home state there. And I'm sure I, I can't remember what events he's won down there, but I mean, he always contends there. He's a, he's a good player and he's got a great golf swing. And, you know, when he got that lead, um, I think you and I both agreed that that Saturday night, that was it. I mean, he was, he, he's that solid enough that he's not gonna, you know, we had the last couple of weeks where we had guys come back from seven shots back to win on the final day, which is, which is pretty much unheard of. That wasn't going to happen with, with Billy Horschel. I mean, he's just a, he's just a solid player there. And, you know, he took advantage of that Saturday when they had some uh, good scoring conditions and, you know, he played, he played unbelievably good 65, I think is what he shot that day um, on Saturday to take that lead. And, and then nobody else could really match him. And, you know, that was, uh, that was very impressive, you know, in its own right there. So, mm -hmm. but like, I, I've thought about it and I'm, I'm very curious to get your opinion though, but I mean, he, to me is a, he's a fringe um, Ryder cup president's cup player, you know, with, with these, these types of wins. And he seems to be a little bit more consistent at a lot of these bigger events here. Uh, how, I mean, cause you're thinking probably we lost DJ to these teams, you know, if he's, if, if, if I'm sure they'll, they'll kind of disqualify them from being available, but if, you know, something like that, if they, if they lose too many people, he's got to be a serious contender for a top 12 spot, doesn't he? Yeah, I think, I think it definitely warrants uh, consideration. He's the 11th ranked player in the world right now. Um, uh, you know, he's been close on a couple of teams. We know 2014 basically because of what happened to him, it, it, Re, revamped the selection process for the U.S. team. Um, you know, Ryan Moore benefited from that in 2016, uh, the guy that was hot at the right time. Um, yeah, I mean, if you think about last year's Ryder Cup team, um, it's it's mostly intact, but we're going to uh, – yeah, Dustin Johnson, I just don't see – I don't see that happening going forward, especially this year's President's Cup team. Think about Harris English. I – He's not going to be on the President's Cup team this year. I, you know, guys, other question marks, Bryson, Daniel Berger. So there's yeah. definitely Finau. There's some definitely – there's going to be some spots. Um, I think that, that the rest of the course is pretty well intact. But if you guys – if you think about Porsche, uh, Zalatoris, um, Cam Young, uh, who, who am I missing? Max. Oh, Max. Yeah. I mean, so there's, there's four or five guys. And I mean, again, we've talked about it before. It just shows the unreal depth of the U.S. team that – one of the best Ryder Cup teams historically last year, and you got you got all these guys that can come in and just and just replace them. And um, there's gonna be a lot of questions also with the with the international team with all of the live golf defections, the um, Louis, Charles Schwartzels, Brandon Grace, um, to name a few. Uh, you know how that's all gonna work out as well. But yeah, Billy's got to definitely be considered. He's had a really good career. He's had a really good career. I mean, in some ways, disappointing, never really been a threat in a major, but also in some ways underrated. He, he comes up and he wins. I mean, seven wins is, it's a lot of wins um, in a career. I mean, he's 35, maybe he'll get to double digits. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, I still don't think he wins a major, um, but you know, in, in some weird alternate universe, what if he makes that 2014 Ryder Cup team? You know, would he be like the American version of Poulter? I don't know. 
I mean, um, he has that similar type of personality, personality and energy where, uh, man, if, if, if he's on the opposite team, that, that can be a guy that's really irritating to play against and, and irritating for opposing fans. So, you know, it's kind of unfortunate it worked out the way it did for him eight years ago when he should have been on that team. And unfortunately, a guy like Webb Simpson was on that team. And I think we all respect Webb now, but Webb shouldn't have been on that 2014 Ryder Cup team. He had to beg for a spot and Tom Watson gave it to him. Um, but yeah, and I, and I want to mention two other things about the golf course and um, how impressive Horschel's play was Saturday. I mean, I saw a lot of uh, Victor Hovland Saturday morning. I got out there and you could do two things at, a, at one of these tournaments, I feel like, and, and I'll, I'm interested in your opinion. You could, um, you could follow groups, which is, it, it can be easy or it can be really hard because when I got out there, Jordan Spieth and Ricky Fowler were playing together. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get a piece of this. I gotta follow these guys. And it was so difficult um, to follow them. I mean, there was hundreds of people following that group and, you know, we did it for two holes and it was, it was, we got, like I said, we got some good looks at them, but it was too, it was too hard to get a good look at either their shots in the fairway or around the green. And so a couple of groups behind them, I see Victor Hovland playing with uh, uh, my guy Grio. And I was like, let's just, let's just watch these guys for a few holes. So following those guys for six or seven holes, that golf course was playing so difficult and the greens really, really firmed up on Saturday. I, I mean, it was hard to not only hit the greens, but if you were on the green to actually place in a spot where you can make a putt. Um, I mean, a lot of these greens uh, and, and if you missed it and if you missed in the wrong spot, it not only brought bogey to play, it brought double to play. I think of a hole like number six, number nine, where if you're on the wrong side of the green chipping down toward the water or the, you know, you would almost have to miss the green and hope that your ball just stayed in the rough for, for your next shot around the green because the, the green complexes were really severe and it really firmed up Saturday. So 65 was an unbelievable score. Um, another thing, watching these guys hit shots, I you know, it's weird. You know, you see Victor Hovland on, on television, you're like, this guy is an unbelievable, unbelievable ball striker, like what, top 10 in the world, right? I mean, that's fair to say. And and it, it was it was great to see him in person, but – I mean, I've seen Johnny Strauser hit shots like that before. I've seen Phil Miller hit a shot like that even once in a while. I've seen a lot of guys that we play with hit shots like that. So it's not it's not necessarily all these shots are the most remarkable thing you've seen. It's just the repeatability and the consistency. Um, the amount of times they, they hit it to 25 feet and around versus someone like me, someone like you, you do it more than me, Victor Havlin does it more than you, you know, it's just, it, that's, that's the difference, I think, um, uh, with the ball striking, at least. Now, the short game is, it, you know, that's, that's another huge separator. You look at a guy like yeah. Cam Smith, who hit the ball like junk, really, the first two days, and just willed himself to the lead because of his short game, and we kind of knew that was going to fall off, and it really did fall off, um, pretty hard on Sunday, but that was just some things I noticed just watching them. Like, you know, I wasn't necessarily like wowed every time uh, someone would hit a shot. I was wowed by watching Cam Young hit the golf ball. Um, unfortunately he, he fell like, I mean, like falling from a building right on Sunday in 84. That was shocking. Uh, I couldn't believe it when I saw the number <laughs> because I, I saw him hit the, I mean, I watched him for a few holes Friday. I'm like, this guy is unbelievable. And uh, so I couldn't believe he shot 84 on Sunday. Uh, that was, that was, <laughs> that, was I, that floored me. Okay. I was wondering why I, I, we both placed live bets on him that Saturday <laughs> and I, I didn't see him in like the top 10 or 15 or whatever. And I'm like, I, and I hadn't even looked at the scores on Sunday, but good God, it's bad. But no, I, I do. I, I like what you said about seeing how these guys hit the ball like that. And I can remember as a, as a, as a young kid going to the Buick open and seeing some of these guys uh, when they, when they pull driver out, one of our favorite, my favorite spots was um, they'd hit their, uh, uh, the eighth hole was a par three, kind of a downhill par three. We'd see them hit their tee shot on the eighth hole. And then, uh, play the, the eighth green and then tee off on nine and we could stand right behind him and, and see the ball flight and everything. I can remember the first time it was in successive groups. I think it was that same year. We, I saw Ernie Els and Phil Mickelson both hit, hit tee shots. And 
I'm probably 15 at the time, you know, who hits it, you know, two two fifteen if it rolls out on a good day or something like that. And these guys just hit these bombs and they just get out there. Ball gets out there so fast. And this is before they had track bands and other devices like that. And just seeing how they, they did that. But what I like to really watch when I went to these events is I just watched also the behaviors of the pros when they were waiting on the tee boxes, reading their putts, when they were talking to their caddies and getting their yardages and, and, and stuff that they were, they were factoring in. And that was always my, my thing, the, the seeing the, 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 the tour sauce stuff that they, how they behaved and, and everything and, and trying to emulate that, you know, when I went and played the local municipal golf course, you know, the following week. So you know, that was always fun. And my favorite thing when I went to golf events, um, especially when I courses I wasn't familiar with, I did the thing where I never, I never walked with groups. I like to walk against the grain. So what I would do is I, we would look at the tee sheet and I'd see, and Mickelson's in this group and then Justin Leonard's in this group. And I'm, I'm picking out some old names here, but this was kind of when these guys were, were, were really, really cool. You know, you had to see Justin Leonard, the open right. champion and all that. And then we'd see guys in successive groups. So we'd, we'd get out and kind of walk backwards. We'd only see him like hit a shot or two. And then we try to get back out ahead of him again and see him hit a shot or two. That caused for a little bit more walking. You really could and, but you didn't have to fight the crowds. So you just kind of waited there, waited for them to pass, you know, hit their shots and moved up. And that was the first time I actually saw, um, saw Tiger Woods in the flesh there. Um, I can remember it. It was only after a year or two after my wife and I had been dating, she came to the Buick Open with me. And I said, Tiff, I said, do you want to see Tiger Woods? I'll get you Tiger Woods. She's like, no, 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 no. I'm not interested there. So we get out on the course and we see this big following that's on the other side of the golf course. And she's like, I want to see Tiger in person. I said, okay, I got you. So, you know, I, I knew the golf course really well from going a year after year after year. So that's what we kind of did is I looked at the, the, the program that they give you with a tee sheet and I'm looking at it and I said, okay, Tiger's here. So we'll watch a couple other groups. So we watched a couple of groups and then we kind of went to this area in the woods and she's like why are we standing here you know type of thing i said just hold on a minute so we waited another like 15 minutes or something like that and then these ropes they pop up and you see come walking by is davis love the third and tiger woods like she could have she could have slugged him in the shoulder we were so close and she's like so i always tell her that story that was probably 2003 yeah. i would say but i still hold to that as my one of my great accomplishments uh, as yeah. a boyfriend at the time well i was gonna say you probably i mean really impressed that's, her by pulling that one off that's I mean, called that, sealing the deal right there she, she, she wants tiger woods yeah we got tiger woods <laughs> that's i love that and uh i actually i really like what you mentioned though because i i followed rory for a little bit on th thursday and again it was it's just it's so hard with these top guys was how many people but yep. just watching I mean that that guy has so much fucking swagger. Uh, it's oh it's, yeah, it's just impressive. But it's the way he carries himself and walks down the fairway. You're like, oh, that that dude's the dude. Yeah. Um, uh, but then you know, specifically watching all of Hovland's front nine uh, Saturday morning, what you mentioned is a really good point. Just seeing how these pros um, carry themselves, how they are, you know, how how they read putts, how they how they get around the greens, and just you know. It, you can really pick up a lot and it, you, you got to do it though with, with one of those groups, that's not where well, there's not a ton of people and you can really have the ability to get, get in certain spots. You know, I, I preferred that over just camping out. We, we, we camped out at nine green a little bit on Friday and, and watched about six, seven, eight groups come in. And, you know, it's cool to see them hit approach shots. That's a fun green to sit in because it's got, it's this natural amphitheater, but uh and I, I like just getting in and, and watching and walking with the guys a little bit more, but with kids, I had to pick my spots where we, we got, we got some rest areas, but um, I definitely think uh, it's, it's going to be uh, a recurring thing for, for me and my, my oldest though, to go back every year. He loved it. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I, I think if anyone's interested in going to tournament for memorials, um, yeah, it would be, it's a good one to go to for sure. So um, what else from the tournament as far as uh, guys that, that impress? We, we, we talk about, well, maybe I do, Aaron Wise quite a bit. Um, he's finally figured out the putter a little bit. Um, ball striking still elite. So um, good to see him contend in a, in a really big tournament. Yeah, I, I 
I mean, I personally thought that he was going to fall off. I know you really liked him as a, as a live win bet, you know, having a chance before he kind of got up there. Yeah. I chickened out. I did place him a top 10 live bet and won something off of that was, was, was mm-hmm. impressed. And that's, that's his yeah. thing. I mean, he's, he's going to hit, he's going to hit the hell out of the ball most every time when he's playing well, it's just, it, it's, you know, figuring out that putter there. And he's, he's been, um, he's been messing with that, that long putter for, for quite a while. And, you know, maybe he's got something figured out and he's playing with a lot of confidence right now. And this, this being an elevated tournament with the elevated field, the, the golf course, it's Jack's event and everything, you know, you, you've placed well in these events. This is the, this is a step below a major. I mean, it's not a major championship, but this is the tier right below it there. So yeah, I was, uh, I was pretty impressed with that. Um, I know Pat Cantley has always had good success there, but that was good to see some life after we were so big on him at the PGA. Maybe there's something um, forming there at, uh, for, for Brookline here next week. And then also I did want, I mentioned Max Homa a second ago, but wanted to mention that again. So good. 72 holes is what he played. And, and for anybody listening, who's kind of unfamiliar with, with golf, I know you're going, you know where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. Think about how many putts you guys who are watching this, how many putts you guys have per hole, two putt on a, on a good hole, three putts. Sometimes maybe occasionally make one putt, 72 holes. He had 99 putts for 72 holes. So 72 of the 99 holes, that is 70, is actually 72% of the holes. He won putted. I mean, he may have had a chip in here and there, which counts as a zero putt, but, but that's neither here nor there. That is unbelievable. That is so unbelievable that nobody on the PJ Tour who's ever played a 72 hole event has ever had less than 100 putts. I mean, he, he's, he's a great ball striker. You know, he's a good player, great player in his own right. And if he gets that putter going, I mean, this is what the, this is the stuff you want to see when you, tr- you know, when you're coming into a major championship, hopefully he didn't kind of, you know, max out and blow his load and all that stuff for, for this week. But I mean, <laughs> check his future, see what he's, see what he's got uh, value at in the US Open. I mean, that, well, that's he, something though, that, that's something that putting stat. Yeah, how does how does sixty six to one sound? Sixty six to one, yeah. multiple you bucks. Got, it's worth something. It's worth something. It is. I mean, it is. It is. He's been one of the ten best players in the world this season. Yeah, just has. I mean, yeah. he's been better than he's been better than Morikawa. Mm-hmm. He's oh yeah. He has arguably been. I was looking at the numbers. Arguably been better than Rory. Um, yeah, he's. I was super impressed with. He did that on Sunday, making two doubles. He doubled ten and eighteen. Um, I mean, and you know, he's just. He's gotten so much better. I mean, if you're talking about most improved player, he's he's the guy. I think, especially two or three years ago. But, yep, it's not. I can't even explain the ninety nine putts with. I mean, we're not talking about flat greens. Imagine the fastest greens you've ever played in your life. And, and to, mm-hmm. to one putt, basically, like we said, 72% yeah. of the holes, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's insane. I didn't know he did that until, until I saw the numbers, but uh, super impressive. Zalatoris back doors in top five. Didn't even feel like he did much, but uh, shows up. Your boy Neiman, another good week. Um, also just continues to put himself there. Um, and I was really disappointed. I missed this in person, but John Rahm almost killed a lady Friday morning. Uh, yes. a, well, a sound lady on PGA tour live. Yes. Um, um, and this guy's, this guy is awful though, isn't he? <laughs> oh, I, I think, yeah, I think when he gets in the moment, when you get him in these events, guys, as uber competitive as he is, he's a pretty horrible human being. I think, really is. I, I, I think there's just that, I think outside of it, he's a, He's a pretty soft-spoken, you know, kind of polite guy. But man, you get him inside the ropes, and and uh, when you when the bell the bell sounds, this guy is is just take no prisoners. Says whatever he wants. Yeah, can we can we stop talking about how Rom's got got his emotions harnessed and like he doesn't, and he's never. I don't think he's going to change he, that. He, I don't think, and, I don't think he should. Yeah. He shouldn't. I mean, that, I think that right there because you look at. In, in guys in other sports or whatever who, who have been known as hotheads and stuff when they quit that stuff i mean that's when they start playing you know whatever sport it is they start playing poorly i mean that's him just deal with it yeah uh, yeah he's he's gonna keep doing this i mean we've seen it pretty much the whole season where 
his his level of plays now is kind of um, it's kind of tapered off a little bit here. Um, and so we're I mean, he still finished 10th, but, you know, I think maybe we're past that that zone he was in in the fall where it felt like he he couldn't lose or he couldn't finish outside the top three. Um, that's all I have for Memorial. Um, said it was a fun, fun, fun week, disappointing results, but uh, we'll uh, move on to Canadian Open. But before we get there, live golf tour, Johnny, um, after we recorded and released the podcast last week, Tuesday is when a lot of shit went down. Um, and <laughs> I was sitting at my kid's baseball game watching you text me, Dustin Johnson. Oh my God. And I'm like, what? And um, I, I was so shocked by it, but then I started thinking about it more. I'm like, well, I shouldn't be. I mean, I know he put out the statement in February um, that he was staying with the tour, but that February is a long time ago now. And uh, after finding out what he got, what he got paid to, to join the tour, $125 million reportedly, uh, almost what doubles his PGA tour career earnings. You can understand it for a guy like DJ. Um, his level of play has, has, has kind of been on the, on the downswing since the 2020 masters. He's done everything you can do pretty much on the PGA tour. Now it's just his major total. I think we're all disappointed though. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely disappointed from just a, a competitive, you know, standpoint there. Um, you know, I, I've never, I've never been offered this amount of money to, to, to change companies or anything like that. So I have no idea how I would, you know, truly react or anything like that, but um, or say that whether this is right, wrong or whatever, that, that doesn't matter there. But the fact that, he was offered that amount of money, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, not to take it. I mean, that's, this is setting up, but you know, what, at what point is too much money or do you play it for the love of the game, the competition and everything like that. So, you know, that's just, that's just wild to me that I didn't think that he would end up being like the first major guy to go over i knew there would be players that would defect some significant ones but i thought it was all going to kind of be a wait and see and where if if they saw some other significant players that went over there just like what greg norman said greg norman said that he was hoping that even if with these garbage fields that are going to start out here he wants to see you know james pyatt make you know you know the u.s amateur champion make $120,000 in, in prize money plus the $2 million or whatever he got to go over there. And he wants to say, you know what? I can beat these guys. I only have to play three days instead of four because they're 54 whole tournaments. I only have to play eight times a year and everything like that. So I think that was kind of the hope. And I think that DJ get is, is humongous. Cause then it's like, it's going to get these other guys thinking. And, and DJ is the least surprising guy to do it because I'm pretty sure DJ just wanted to be a, just a golf and fishing dad at 45 years old and pretty much retired from anything. And now he can probably only play in two or three more years of, of the live golf stuff. And then he retires at, at 42. So, you know, I, I think this is, you know, he doesn't really care what people think of him. He's only concerned with uh, his inner circle, his family and, and everything. That's, that's all he's there to please. And he made the decision based on that. So with that being said, you know, I, I think that could hit getting that big of a get there this early could be a, a you know, a starter to what, what comes because the, the Saudis are, and everything, they're going to keep offering money to, to these players to come over. I mean, the, you know, you know, what, with what happened to Phil Mickelson and, and I know you were going to lead in that Mickelson officially signed Saturday, supposedly he got, you know, significant more money than DJ. And then you look at it, he was probably using that as a, as a negotiating ploy, like, you know, just to wait as long as he could. And he got the maximum amount is what he thought he could make. So it's interesting, but um, I didn't think that they'd get any big name other than Phil Mickelson for the first event. But this, this, this is a little bit better than I think uh, what Greg Norman would have wanted or expected. Yeah. It's, it's, um, the DJ get was, was huge. I think he's the perfect headliner for the tour because um, he's not going to bother trying to answer any questions about any, anything to do with the political situation with Saudi Arabia. He's just, he'll probably give one liners. I'm here to play golf. 
you know, whatever. We know we know he went for the money. We know all these guys went for the money for some, you know, they, they all have a way of they all have a way of saying it in their statements that they're doing it for other reasons, this new exciting tour, you know, whatever. This thing's gonna be bad to start. It's gonna be bad. And I I know you and I were talking today, we both are anxious to see how bad it's gonna be. We're gonna the, the coverage, the broadcast, um, you know, it's gonna be on YouTube and the and the live golf website so it's 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 going to be bad in a lot of ways but it's not going away because there's so much money they're just going to keep throwing at it and for the rest for this season next year um so now the question is who who else will defect um will there be any big names i was shocked to see taylor gooch i think that was like the one young american top 40 player that you're like, oh, that's that's surprising. DJ, you can understand. A lot of these other guys, you can understand. But to see Gooch on there was, was surprising. Uh, like Kevin Na, no surprise. All the Euro Tour guys that are that in their forties, the the Westwoods, uh, Graham McDowell's, Kymers, no no shock there. Um, and what's kind of disappointing to me is I, I guess the draft for the teams is tomorrow. Um, but they're not televising that. I'm like, that's that's one of the things that makes you unique, right? Compared to the PJ tour, compared to the, the the DP world tour is the team aspect. And you're not even televising the draft. I mean, how does that work? Is is it like our fantasy football draft where, where DJ's in one side of the room and he's he's you know selecting, you know, James Piot. I mean, I, I don't know how that's gonna work. Or I got Andy Ogletree. I, I don't I don't really know how that works, but we're not gonna find out because they're not televising it. So I don't get that. Um I, there's just so many unknowns to the whole thing still. And, uh, you know, I, I guess we'll find out more as we go. And, and, and but the whole thing is just, I don't know. It's, it's laughable. I guess, will there be growth to the point in what, two, three years where this thing is a sustained product where it's a viable tour? Um, my question for you is, with all of the statements that were made, we started with Kevin now over the weekend. And then uh, before we went on, I saw there were statements from agents of Brandy Gray, Sergio Garcia, Charles Schwartzel about them resigning from the tour. Do you think this thing's going to go down this legal road where, you know, guys are trying to make sure they hold on to their pension? They're still able to play in majors. How's that all going to work out, especially with the U.S. Open next week? I mean, it sounds like Mickelson from what it, what all indications are he might be at the u.s open next week yeah it's he uh um he actually interviewed with uh with bob herrig of sports illustrated and said that he is playing and he hasn't been informed that he's not invited so i i think i think a lot of these uh they were the major championships i think they're going to kindly kind of just you know, step away. If they want to play in it, they want they, you know they've qualified for it. Now, what may happen going forward is some of these major championships may change the criteria that you know if you play in the the live golf, um, you know you have pretty much no way of of qualifying for it. That may end up happening there, but True, you know, because I think there's no world there's no world ranking points. So yeah, that, there's not significant. But what about a guy like DJ though? Exactly. And, and that's, that's going to be interesting to see where this kind of goes, because yeah, I, I think this is going to be a lot of, uh, uh, there's gonna be a lot of court battles. There's going to be a lot of, of, of that just because yeah, with pensions, with, uh, with being able to play in these events, because, you know, PGA tour players and pro golfers, actually pro golfers for the most part are, uh, are independent contractors. Now, the one thing that is so the PGA tour is so strongly against is, the PJ Tour is run by the the, the players. Um, Jay Monahan is the commissioner, but he doesn't set the rules. He just enforces the rules. And there are there are specific rules in the uh, you know in their bylaws stating that they cannot play in these events, the, the, these conflicting events. And if they do, they are subject to discipline. It's just he's just you know, he's just enforcing it. And, and I think that's where some of it is getting lost now, whether they, they redo those in the off season or in coming years, I, I don't know, but, you know, I, I think this is going to be a, a messy battle and the PGA tour has actually done, I think done quite a bit of in the, in the right by 
not overreacting and not putting out statements and not threatening bands, you know, specifically, you know, they're just kind of sticking to the, you know, subject to discipline and, and, you know, they're, they're kind of, um, um, you know, slowly tiptoeing uh, in around and through the issue. And I think they're going to kind of let it play out, but I think we're going to see, I mean, I it really, I, I think in the end, it's going to be, it's going to be how, how many players, you know, end up wanting to defect and wanting to play. The next event after this one is, uh, is in Oregon. And there is a, there, there's a rule that they, like a PGA tour player, anybody who's a member of the PGA tour. So Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, you know, any of these guys, um, if they want to play in an event, they have to request a waiver. And 90% of the time, the, the PGA Tour is fine with it. You know, they may come with some stipulations and stuff because they had played in Saudi Arabia before. And they say, well, if you play in this, you got to play in other ones. Well, if you, you, they cannot play in any professionally sanctioned event in the United States. It is in there. They don't, they can't request a waiver. They can't play in them and they're, and they're subject to discipline. So it'll be interesting to see. That'll be the next event. And I think a lot of it will go because a lot of the stuff is they're throwing in this, this, these deals, you know, signing Mickelson just days before the, the tournament week starts, it's going to go up until the last possible minute. So we'll see if, if that happens, you know, you get a little bit more serious because then you've got a rival tour that's playing on the same, in the same country as the PGA tour. And, and that's where I think it can create a little bit more competition, but these little unorganized events in, in London and, and, you know, wherever else they're playing. I, I don't think it really concerns them too much, but if you allow this tour to get enough headway, I mean, they're going to keep throwing money at it. They're going to throw money at it. They're going to throw millions of billions of dollars at it. And, and that's where it's going to get, get interesting because a lot of these guys who, who we've seen, I mean, they're near the end of their careers. They're on the downside of their playing careers. A lot of them are taking the, uh, the you know the, the the big chunk of money and the guaranteed purses and everything and then you're getting looking at these young guys like david puig of arizona, arizona state and Piot who uh michigan state just won they're not going to have to play in the the corn ferry events and struggle where they're only making you know 50 60 70 thousand dollars a year so you know it it's it's going to be interesting there's i don't think it's going to be settled <laughs> like in, in on the golf course or in the meeting room, I think this is going to end up, you know, where where some people are going to take the PGA Tour to court. I think the PGA Tour is going to be the same, and it it could get it, it could get a little wild in terms of just the direction that that they go because the PGA Tour doesn't want to give up anything, and 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 obviously if they're starting to get these players in here, you know that that that's something that we got you know we got an event and then we'll have to go from there i saw uh i saw i saw odds today for it i'm 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 looking at fanduel <laughs> odds right now i just brought that up oh it is on fanduel uh action network has odds via fanduel okay okay so, I saw I saw on a on an offshore book that there was odds and I saw DJ was the favorite with Gooch behind him. Um, but I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where we're breaking down live golf events. But uh, you know, at some point we might have we have to just for the hell of it. Um, because yeah. it's 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 kind of laughable. I don't really get the team aspect yet, but um maybe we'll find out this weekend. We'll definitely be talking about it though next Monday. Uh we have to a little bit. Um Gosh, so we're, I think we're 50 minutes in. Uh, I predicted about 40, and so we're, we're 10 minutes behind. So we got to get to the Canadian Open and get down to uh, get down to business about who might win this tournament the week before the U.S. Open. Um, guys haven't, the RBC Canadian Open have not played at this golf course since uh, 2010 um, at uh, St. George's Golf and Country Club. I think it was Carl Pedersen. Uh, who won there in 2010? That's that's, that's, that is that's a good reference. Yeah, that's another era, huh? Um, which, by the way, walking into the memorial has has these you know picture signs of every winner, and you know, so my kids are like, oh, when the tournament started, what 1980? I'm like, yep, yep. And then then we get to Carl Pedersen, and my, my kid said, wait, who's that guy? He won the tournament, and I said, yep. And then they get to William McGirt, and they're like, he won too. I'm like, yep. Dirt McGirt won. Yep. Um, 
yeah, still shocked about that one. Um, so yeah, last time it was played at this golf course, 2010, Carl Pedersen wins. Um, first time the Canadian Open has been held since 2019. That was the year Rory uh, really won in dominating fashion. Par 70, but we're talking about five par threes um, and three par fives. So less of an emphasis on par four scoring, more of an emphasis on par three and par five scoring. <clears throat> All the par fives look to be reachable. Uh, a lot of short par fours, short golf course. Um, it seems to be driving accuracy is, is a critical thing here. Uh, I don't know. What else have you seen from, from any research you've done? Well, I think it's, uh, yeah, it, it's pretty tree lined. Um, so driving accuracy is going to be very important. So strokes gained off the tee, maybe fairways gained off the tee. Um, the, the greens are going to be crowned. So when the greens are crowned, you think you have this much space to hit, but you've only got like that much space or the ball is going to roll off the green. Um, so strokes gained approach. And I'm sure there's going to be, uh, you know, around the greens as well, uh, strokes gained. But you got to keep it in play. Um, it's not one of these these courses where you can head all over the map and, and expect to score on. Sounds about right to me. Um, it's a good field. It's a really good field the week before a major. Um, three guys have, have separated themselves in the odds. Um, it's, it's a really kind of an interesting odds board. I guess four guys really have, but JT and Scheffler are co-favorites on, on DraftKings at plus 700. Rory is at plus 800 and Cam Smith's at plus 1,000. Uh, Matty Fitzpatrick at 1,600. Shane Lowry at 1,600. Burns coming off a win on his last start, 1,800. Hatton at 2,000. Uh, I, I can't even believe what I'm reading on this next, this next guy. Harold Varner is at 2,200. And he's the same odds as Corey Connors at 2,200, who just hit the ball unbelievably at the Memorial. And Tony Finau's at plus 3,000. I don't get the Varner number at all. Do you? I mean, he played good at Colonial for 60 holes. So, I mean, sure. there, there, there's, there's that. But, no, that number is – there's got to be – there's got to be a lot of money, a lot of public or, or – pro money on him, something to drive that price like that. Cause he's, he's not 22 to one. That's, that's like, that's like tour. the, that's like the Russell Henley at the masters line on DraftKings. Like, yeah. Um, so I think, I think you have, you have some good options at the top. Um, Rory's had a good history in Canada, obviously. Um, JT, in his last start didn't play great, but obviously before that wins, wins a PGA and still the hottest player in the world, Scotty Scheffler right there at the top. Um, do you make a choice of one of the three guys or is it just, are all of them too short? They're in, in that 800 or less range. I mean, if you look at how Scotty Scheffler has been playing for since spring, it is hard to bet against him because you're like no you can't win every single week and scotty scheffler's like mm -hmm. yeah I, I can i can do that so i mean if not for that bomb that burns drained at colonial i mean scotty scheffler is probably going to win that event so yeah. i i seven to one i hate the number but i have a hard time figuring out a way to get him keep him off my card i mean because until he proves that he can't win every single week. I don't, I, you know, I don't know. You know, we talked about last week about, um, you know, throwing John Robb with a, a, a parlay to, to boost it above, you know, like 10 or 11 or 12 to one. That didn't I know that work. Didn't, the first two legs I did worked, I think with the co top 10 and uh, on the LPGA. And then uh, um, uh, I had the, uh, Golden State team total over, but yeah, um, Rob you took the team total. Six. We we talked about on the podcast taking the gold. Yes, State I ended up line. taking the, the yeah. So I didn't take the I didn't take the money line there, but yeah, funny enough. But of those guys, um, Justin Thomas, I think uh, he's he's just getting some swings in for uh, for Brookline. He's he's not he's not interested in winning this. Now he may he may stumble it around and win it, but of those guys, I might bite on Scheffler. Um, of those top three and then cam smith uh not a good enough uh driver of the golf ball and he didn't he didn't hit the ball well enough at memorial to 
to warrant 10 to one odds for me. Uh, and then, and then Lowry and Fitzpatrick feel a little bit overvalued at that at 16. As yeah. Well. Yeah. Lowry's not bad, but Lowry just, he's not, he doesn't have that trustworthy win factor under 20 to one. Cause you get guys under 20 to one. You, you want those guys to, to feel like they're going to win. And, you know, Fitzpatrick's not going to win. Although if, you know, if he gets his putting, he, as well as he hit the ball, he was, he putted so bad at Memorial. Um, but I, I think I'm going to keep those off my card. The only guy I'm going to really consider is, is Scotty Scheffler. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I, I could definitely see Scheffler. I could see a case for JT. Um, I want to, I want to talk about Rory. I, I, I feel like, <laughs> I mean, he, he hit it. Anyway, he was ninth off the tee last week, 24th in approach. I feel like he hit it fairly well. Um, he really started to bleed uh, strokes on the green over the weekend, lost two and a half strokes on Saturday's round where he fell out of contention. But, man, it feels like he's on the the, the verge. Um, I like his history in Canada. I, I want to play Rory. Um, it's just – I don't know, man. He just he just does it to us every tournament. It feels like where he's there, he's there, and then he has a bad stretch, and he just he, he it almost you can see his shoulders drop. Like, oh man, I just I kind of I kind of killed it. I, I just lost the tournament there. But I want to I want to play Rory uh, of those guys at plus eight hundred. The only guy I would touch under plus two thousand. Um, I know we didn't talk about Burns coming off a of victory, but the likelihood of him winning again. Back to back, four times this season seems unlikely as well, um, and I almost feel that way with Scheffler. Like he can't, can't keep winning. Um, obviously, that's been that's been a bad take, though. Been a bad take. It, exactly. Um, so I, I think if anyone, I would go Rory. I don't really have any any hard numbers to back it up, but I think my favorite play is, um, and, and I know these kind of guys haven't done well. In Canada, the Canadians, there's, they put the, the pressure on themselves to win them. Um, I, I think Mike Weir always had that issue, it seemed like, back in the day. But Corey Connors, um, God, he hits the ball so good. Um, and he just, I mean, like he really played amazing um, from tee to green this past weekend, which is, you know, pretty much a staple of his game. Um, I mean, week to week out there, uh, 16 uh, off the tee, first in approach on the week. I gained eight strokes on approach, but 58th around the green, 51st in putty. And it's just not going to get you a win. Um, I want to play Connors. I want him to win. Um, so I'll probably find a number or find a way to play him and just uh, accept the eventual loss. I, I agree with you on the, 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 you know, the thought of the Canadians not being able to win this event. And I think they want to win it so bad. And I mean, if you think about it, and, and I, uh, when I went to college, knew uh, several of my, my, my college golf teammates were, uh, were from Canada. Um, and they, I mean, they raved about this event. This was, this was their thing. I always talked about the Canadian Open and, and how much they, they, they loved watching it. And they loved how the, when the Canadian players played well. And I think these guys want to win this event so bad. And I would love to see, I, I just would love it. I, I, I like a lot of the Canadian players, um, but I'd love to see a Canadian player win the, the Canadian Open there. So I don't know, though, if I can bet him to win at, at the 22 to 1 odds, but I don't mind it. Um, I think of any of the Canadian players, this guy, this guy's got the game and he's, he can ball strike his way around that golf course. Um, putting is is not as critical because of the, the crown greens there. So you're going to have in general, shorter, shorter putts if you hit a lot of greens. So he makes sense, a lot of sense at this golf course. So I'm going to try to find a way on this card. I just don't know if I can, if I can reach it that 22 to one yet, but we're only, we're only on a Monday. So we'll see. He lost three and a half strokes putting the first two rounds at the Memorial, but he gained two and a half the last two rounds. So maybe, maybe he found something there on the weekend. Uh, I mean, just be zero. And uh, I think he's there. Fee now at 3000. I think we were kind of just, I think we probably feel about the same on him. I think it's probably a, nope. 
a no go at this point. Yep. Uh, 45 to about 80. I mean, it's a really small number of guys. Uh, Munoz at 45, Adam Hadwin, another Canadian at 45, Keith Mitchell, Pat Reed, Chris Kirk at 50. So Heath the Gala off a great week. T5 last week at 65 to one. Johnny Vegas was in the mix last week as well for a while, 70 to one. CT Pan, JJ Spawn, Justin Rose at 80. Mackenzie Hughes also at 80. Um, Patrick Reed, first of all, uh, when I got to the course Friday, one of the first groups I see is are, are Reed and Rory. Reed looks slimmer. He really, he really looks slimmer. And he stayed back and signed some autographs after his round. And I told, I told my kids, hey, get up there. It's P Reed. He never, he's not, he's never going to sign. Um, he was like three or four autographs and he was out, but um, Patrick Reed is at 50 to one. Um, it's an interesting number, I think on him uh, because it feels like he's making his way back a little bit. Um, you know, he's kind of, was it, was it at colonial a couple of weeks ago where, Kind of, kind of saw him. Was it uh, Saturday's round, Friday or Saturday's round, where he was he was up at the top? Um, you know, he ditched the PXG driver. He's getting some more distance out of his driver, just more consistency. Still think there's huge questions with his ball striking, but it feels like we're ascending again with him. And it, it might be still a, a time where you can grab a number that's really pretty low on him. I. I agree. I don't know if this is the golf course, but he is trending that way. And, and a lot of times he wins. I, I don't know if he, a lot of times, but when he's won before, I should say, it's been on golf courses like that where you're just like, nah, you, you know, really doesn't, doesn't, doesn't totally go well with him. He, he, he's good enough that he can find the way with that short game and everything. Yeah. He did get rid of that trash driver that he was, had been, awful with all year and ever since then um you know he's been significantly better um off the tee and and that's just you know obviously makes the, the the game of golf easier when you can hit it from the fairway at a shorter distance so yeah um the field is pretty good that's a i think it's a fair number on him and is it, it almost feels like we're getting into uh when he won at tory where he was just kind of hanging around at that kind of number there that it's like you kind of feel comfortable that he could he could play some well i liked them last week and and that 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 didn't end up working out at all but um i'm gonna bet him this week and i'm gonna put a little bit of money on a win bet i don't know if it's gonna be a best bet and i don't because i think because he kind of because it kind of hurt me last week but I think there's something there and I think we're going in the right direction and it might be a month. It might be six weeks. It might be a little while. He's going to start playing a little bit. Cause I, I think he's going to see that he needs some president's cup points and, and everything. And I think we're going to see some results on him. So that's, that's somebody I'm, I'm kind of a fan of there. And I, I, I do like Adam Hadwin's game a lot too. And I know this is the Canadian at the Canadian open, but you know, he's going to want to play well and um, play pretty good at Memorial made a uh, made that hole in one there early in the week and um, had a good week. Otherwise um, he's a guy like don't totally love the other names. Uh, Say the gala though, as a, as a top finish. I think he's a he's a pretty streaky player. When 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 he gets it going, I think you kind of kind of have to go with it. So you know, I might look at him at like a top twenty, maybe a first round lead. Maybe he'll 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 come through this time. You know, instead of bogey the last two on uh, on uh, of his round and, and win us some money. But you know, Reed Thagala, Thagala and Hadwin are the ones that jump out at me on the, on that list. Mackenzie Hughes, it feels like a Mackenzie Hughes type of golf course. I know his form hasn't been uh, great um, the last, I guess, well, I guess really the 22 calendar season, top 40 at Memorial. Um, I, I, you know, it just feels like a course where it's more of a small ball, um, get, get the ball and play like he does. And, um, and I just, I, I kind of trust him even though I, I, he's never really came through for me. He did, he, he was, I, there are a lot of names in this range that uh, my kids got autographs from. Mackenzie Hughes is one of them. Um, also down there, Doug Gim, 
we get I, my kids are like who's that i'm like that's doug gibb <laughs> who's that jt poston uh so we had a lot of that like we had a lot of adam long situations jt poston i'd be like yeah i gotta look at that guy pretty closely um johnny the the the, the numbers drop off from 100 to 1 uh, a lot of the field is past 100 to 1 it's like i said the odds are really strange this week not a lot of guys under 100 to 1 but a, a bunch over it so if you have a name or two above that give them uh, give them out now i i am I am. I've never seen odds like this on a full PGA Tour event like this, where you've got so few guys under a hundred to one, and then everybody yeah, else there. Yeah. So, just so odd there. Um, yes, I did. Uh, where was his name here? I like um, Brendan Todd at a hundred to one. Um, the Todd Father. Yep. Yep. The Todd Father. Um, you know, he's he's he, he's got signs of life there. He's playing some decent golf there. Um, I'll, I'll be disappointed if you don't if you don't mention our boy. Way down. Ooh, way down. Okay, but, uh, I'm I'm still look. I haven't got the Aaron Rye. Um, we've picked him before. I think he's a good he's a good player. It's uh, you know, I don't know. It just feels like he could contend here. I still not sh- I'm not sure if he's going to end up uh, uh, end up winning here. I'm looking. I have not looked at the field this low. Um, that's all like, yet and it's it's not good past the top what it's it's this god i feel this could either be a top level guy or you're gonna get a guy like I, robert streb or something oh, like that that's a good call it's 250 to one which actually is it's, is not is not, is not bad there yeah um who are you talking about who's who's our guy well it's a it's a, it's a canadian player it's a guy that we're normally on He's at 250 to one. It's Adam Svensson. Adam Svensson, a good ball striker. 250 to one. That's that's pretty low. I like that. Like you throw um, you throw a dollar on two two dollars on him, win five hundred yeah, if he wins. There you go. I don't know if he'll win, but yeah, he's going to win know. his na- his national championship. Uh, Pat Rogers at 200 to one. Um, I always I, like Pat Rogers. <laughs> I purposely didn't say that. I was just waiting for you to. Uh, or we could talk about Brian Stewart. Brian Stewart, 250. Uh, yeah. Who qualified for the U.S. Open he, today. He, he did. He did. And Chase Chase Seifert qualified as well. He's at 250. Um, I do want to talk about, I feel like, did Wesley Bryan qualify today? I feel like he was there when I saw him on the leaderboard. But he's at um, 400 to 1. He's at 400 to one to win, but not, not interested in a win with Wesley Bryant, but my typical random let's, let's take Wes Bryant on the top 20 is at 1100. Um, okay. I want to throw one stupid storyline at you here. <laughs> well, I love it. Okay, first guy. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the odds here on my phone because my computer's frozen. Here. First guy to apply for, to play and oh, yeah. live golf <laughs> yep. ends up not Ooh. getting into the event. Mm. No. Robert Garrigus wins the RBC Canadian Open. So he gets his, you know, yep. makes his money and all that stuff because he's got like no status right there. How about that for a storyline? I, I like that one. Weird yeah. things have happened. I, I think everybody say. else would have, I think it would have to be like a massive like car crash or a hotel or something that caught on fire <laughs> to win, but. I did joke about Doug Gim, but I actually kind of like Doug Gim this week too. 180. I, I, I do feel like it's going to be like Rory or JT or Scheffler or one of these guys at 150 to 200 to one. Yeah. It, it feels like we haven't had one of those in, in a few events. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Cause what, what you get around these golf courses, you get some guy who, who hits it fairly straight, doesn't necessarily hit it long. So you're not like a, a guy like JT who, who just hits bombs and everything, but a guy who just k- keeps it in play and hits it, doesn't miss a fairway, doesn't miss a green, and then just has a decent putting week that sits there at like 150 to one or 100 to one, you know, some, you know, some kind of crazy number. It's just trying to figure out who that is and then possibly live betting them during the event. Um, that maybe it comes up with a good number that maybe has some 
uh, good strokes gain stats there. But there's some there's some why you know there's some names out there that aren't normally in PGA Tour events this this high. No, that's that's for sure. Um, and you might see a situation where one of these top players gets up to a slow start and they can, they might mail it in and be like, all right, I'm off. I'm off to the U.S. Open. Um, yeah, you know, I've seen that quite a, quite a few times. So. All right. Uh, Canadian Open this week. And uh, it's it's really just uh, just a waiting game on the U.S. Open next week. So. Uh, we'll be back next Monday to break it all down. Johnny, thanks for uh, doing it once again. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back next week to talk about Canadian Open, the Live Golf debut, and the U.S. Open next week. So uh, take a look at our best bets up on Wednesday. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.